Hey everybody, welcome back to Pathways to Wealth. In this interview, I'm talking with Paul Snow, who's the co-founder and chief architect of Factum, which is a cryptocurrency that works with Bitcoin. So I've actually been following Factum for quite a while now, and I'm really excited because I think this is where cryptocurrencies are headed. You know, it's kind of companies like Factum are kind of driving the Bitcoin 2.0 movement where... Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are more than just a currency. They can do things like change the mortgage industry or change the property record industry or change the way that we track and verify contracts and just some really, really cool things. And Factum is kind of driving that industry and they're working with countries like Honduras and China and although it's a slow process with what they're working on, I find it very interesting and even if you're a beginner to Bitcoin or digital currencies uh, and maybe you've never heard of Factum, I think even though this interview is a little bit technical, um, it's really good to be aware of what's going on in this space. That way you can kind of forecast where the opportunity is. So um, I really love how Paul just drops a lot of analogies of, you know, how Bitcoin works, how Factum works with Bitcoin, and he goes into some depth into the projects that they're working on and really how his vision of Factum is to change a lot of big industries like the mortgage industry and bring a lot of these kind of archaic processes into the 21st century. So I hope you're excited for this interview. It's a really good one. Um, this is something that I think that everybody should be aware of. Um, and without further ado, let's uh, talk to Paul Snow. Hey everybody, welcome back to Pathways to Wealth. In this episode, I have Paul Snow, co-founder and Chief Architect of Factum. Paul, thanks for being here, man. Well, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. So what else should everybody know about you? Give us a little background on oh, where goodness. you come from and, and let's just dive into the meat and potatoes of what Factum is and go okay. from there. Well, uh, I'm a Lu Louisiana boy. I was grown up, uh, raised in Louisiana, uh, born in, out in the West in Wyoming, but uh, raised in uh, Louisiana on a farm and in uh, Found my way to Texas A&M, where I, I did graduate work in computer science and electrical engineering, and have done a bunch of things since then. I, I wrote a PostScript clone, the first one to ship against the PostScript interpreter uh, implemented by Adobe Systems. I have no idea what that means. Well, it, more than likely, if you have a printer, uh, it runs PostScript. And okay. It, it's a printing language. And back in the digital printing revolution, which was as exciting to people as Bitcoin is today <laughs> to Bitcoiners, <laughs> uh, PostScript was a big deal, and I got involved in that space. Nice. Um, I also wrote a rules engine that does the eligibility determination for programs like Medicare, Medicaid, uh, that sort of stuff, TANF, SNAP, in the state of Texas. So billions of dollars in assistance funds are validated and approved through software that I wrote. Now, I didn't, nice. I don't know anything about the 3,000 decision tables that run on that rules engine, uh, but the rules engine itself. You uh, just built it. Yeah, I, I designed and built it. In fact, I, I even remember quite clearly the day that I promised to the state of Texas that we would have a rules engine, and we walked out and all my coworkers' jaws were dropped because, you know, uh, executing decision tables was not anything any software did, especially not written in Java. So you guys were pushing so the boundaries. I was pushing the boundaries. Nice. And, and now I, you're pushing the boundaries in cryptos. Yes, absolutely. Pushing the boundaries always. Nice. So how did you get started in Bitcoin and cryptography and, and then I guess eventually cryptocurrencies? Well, I was interested in all along. Uh, 2010, I maybe heard about it. 2011, I saw something about it again and went over to Mt. Gox. You've ever heard of those guys? Oh, yeah. yeah. Stand-up folks, I hear. Stand-up folks. Yeah. And bought uh, a big pile of Bitcoin for, for some change that I had in a PayPal account. Uh, there was like a brief window where you could move money from PayPal into Mt. Gox. Nice. And I bought a bunch of Bitcoin. And then kind of didn't pay much attention to it because I hadn't read the white paper and hadn't uh, and I had a bunch of other things going on. What did you buy at what price? 
Uh, seventy cents. Seventy cents. Yeah. Oh, nice. 70, so, so a little 70 bit cents. lower than a thousand bucks. Yeah, a little lower, a little higher than five cents <laughs> where it started on Mount Gox. Well, in any case, um, so I I I picked up this uh, Bitcoin from Mount Gox and didn't really pay too much attention to it. Uh, didn't read the white paper, but uh, coming into two thousand thirteen, at the end of two thousand twelve, beginning of two thousand thirteen. It did come back on my radar, and I um, somewhere along the way I did realize that I had Bitcoin sitting at Mt. Gox, and I did move it into a wallet. And, and so you were off. able to get it out of there. Oh yeah, long long <laughs> before there was any real problems with Mt. Gox. Nice. Um, and uh, then I started experimenting in all the different ways to buy Bitcoin. Uh, I was a, a a customer of Charlie Shrim. Uh, I used his bit instant. I, I believe it was bit instant. Yeah. Uh, so. And I used uh, Coinbase. I got. I was one of their early uh, customers, um, and, and a bunch of others. And local uh, bitcoins. Local bitcoins. Yeah. yeah. Went went to the McDonald's and and. Oh met, man, you actually did it. Yeah, you met, did it old school style. Met with uh, uh, Austin Bitcoin. Uh, some guy that had some sort of handle like that and uh, <coughs> bought myself $300 worth of Bitcoin mm. and uh, and a, a bunch of other stuff. So I and I accumulated, I was wiring money to Japan to, to buy Bitcoin. Uh, so much. so you, you believed in it. So you, you got into it, you didn't know what you were really into, and then you, you're, you realized what it was. What was it that made you go, yeah, this is actually something viable? Well, reading actual technical documentation of how Bitcoin worked. There were some misconceptions that I had as a techie uh -huh. from the journalistic descriptions of how Bitcoin worked that made me go, what the heck? They have no idea what they're doing. Um, when I realized what they really were doing, then I, I got pretty excited about it. I started um, um, working with the Bitcoin meetup group here mm -hmm. and was very, very active with them through 2013, started having uh, many conferences in Austin each month for a couple or three months um, where I met Jason King, where I got my uh, keep Bitcoin keep, keep weird. Bitcoin weird. Nice. He shows up to talk at the little mini conference and hands out some t-shirts. Uh, met, uh, met a bunch of other interesting people um, in that space. Then I told uh, the meetup group, we kind of got together, said we really would like to do something bigger. And so we uh, put together the Texas Bitcoin Conference that ran uh, in 2014, 2015. May still run again this year, but, but pushed off and maybe to the fall. I just really got way too busy to organize another conference on top of everything else I'm doing. Right yeah, now. I know that that conference the past couple of years I, has been mm -hmm. pretty much the biggest conference, right? I mean, that's the... I don't know that it's been the biggest, but it, it certainly has pulled in tons and tons of content, yeah. and it's gotten a lot of play on in the space and uh, has a, uh, acquired a lot of mind share. Yeah. Yes. Nice. So how did you come to start Factum? What, what was the idea behind that? Okay. Well, after the conference in 2014, uh, the first Bitcoin conference, uh, David Johnston pulled me aside and really, really wanted me to start a project. He was doing everything he could to seed a lot of different projects in this space. He's a big believer in distributed, autonomous uh, corporations, uh, projects, businesses. And so he said, you know, why don't you do something? And I'm like, well, you know, I, you know I've got to get this conference done. So he said, well, after the conference, a month or two after the conference in 2014, after I'd kind of cleaned up some things, I, I had a meeting with him and he, and he threw a little funding at me and said, why don't you just spend a couple months thinking? And I spent a couple of months thinking about um, what could be done, uh, thought about distributed identity, thought about trusted execution um, using hashes that are in the Bitcoin blockchain to prove the uh, validity and val um, of uh, and integrity of the software that you're running and and maybe even software that you're building um, even feedback models to provide uh, funding to open source projects that sort of thing uh, but every project that I laid out and every Bitcoin uh, based 
approach to these kinds of applications came back to the unfailing observation that there just isn't enough blockchain space and the time the one meg the one meg yeah. limit but just even if even if uh even if that was unlimited it's just very very awkward to build bitcoin transactions which may or may not show up in the block when you want them to mm -hmm. and may come in actually get recorded in orders that are different unless you literally wait 10 20 30 minutes before you put the next entry in so the, all the timing models for this stuff um, weren't working. So that's when I decided to found this thing called notary chains. And I even remember coming up to David and I said, David, this is really a little tiny project. It's you probably even not going to even think it's very interesting, but we'll just do this notary chains thing that will give us a platform to do this, this other interesting stuff. Yeah. And so I started working on notary chains for about a month, and then we started bringing some people in. And then the synergy and the understanding of how important this was as a foundational layer to not just the kinds of projects I wanted to build, but all kinds of other things um, began to sink in. And as that sank, uh, began to sink in, we decided to brand it Factum, not Notary Chains. It's a little easier to market and talk about. And um, it, Factum was born. Uh, Factum started out as a, cent uh, or Notary chain started out as a centralized solution so that you really didn't need any kind of uh, token or any kind of um, uh, fancy accounting. Uh, you would just basically pay people and they would, uh, record your stuff um, but that's prone to censorship because mm -hmm. that now you get tied mm -hmm. to a particular provider for recording your data and so when you start looking at the censorship issues and the usability issues and the timing issues and even the overhead of accounting see if every time I want you to record something into Bitcoin um, first of all, you give me your data and you make a Bitcoin transaction to pay for it. I'm, I'm actually increasing the overhead of the blockchain, not decreasing it. So right. Well, okay. So Paul, let's do this. Let's do like an explain, like I'm sure. five, like, so you have Bitcoin, which is mm -hmm. a peer to peer distributed ledger. And then you have Factum that kind of sits on top of Bitcoin, right? Is That's that how right. You explain it. So for for the lay person who's like brand new to Bitcoin or brand new to Factum and doesn't really understand how that works, how would you explain that? Okay. Well, the the interesting thing to know about Bitcoin in this context is that Bitcoin is this massively secure ledger. Mm -hmm. That's how transactions and money can exist in Bitcoin because nobody can mess with the past. Yeah. And each transaction has a digital signature on it. It's like a lock. And only the person that owns the money has the key to that lock that can allow another transaction to use those funds. So I have a absolutely secure ledger and I have an absolutely secure mechanism for documenting a transfer of money or Bitcoin in this case on that ledger. Now, how secure is it? Well, there's literally petahashes per second. You know, you've got your, your, your tens and you have your thousands and then you have your millions, then you have your billions, then you have your trillions, then you have your quadrillions. So you're up to quadrillions of hashes per second. So a little bit of data, basically. Well, this is computational power. Yeah. Building this lock that's securing this ledger. In order to break the Bitcoin ledger, you would have to have more processing power than that. And, and, and to be, re even to the layperson, you may not understand, you could take 500,000 supercomputers and you would yet not have enough computational power. So that's what secures Bitcoin. A lot of people yes. hear of like, you know, Mt. Gox and Silk Road mm -hmm. and they say, isn't hasn't Bitcoin been hacked or isn't it a scam that's just kind of gone away? And I mean, you've seen all the obituaries mm -hmm. that have been written, but the reality is that Bitcoin is so secure that even the most powerful computers right now can't even come close to hacking it. Right. When people talk about Bitcoin being hacked, like Mt. Gox and whatnot, 
they're talking about people taking these private keys, these, these cryptographic keys, and stealing them. They're not able to break the locks and break the ledger, but they are able to break the people who hold these keys. Yeah, like the third-party services and the exchanges. And right. And so if I get my computer hacked and somebody steals my private keys, then they can create transactions and take my money and put it someplace else and secure it under different keys. And now I can't access my funds. They have effectively stolen my money. Right. And so that's where you get thefts and that's where things can break. But Bitcoin itself never been hacked, not not as it's constructed. Nice. So now let's suppose I have this and so this is... This is a safe, and let's consider it like it's Mt. Gox. If, if, if forget all the mumbo-jumbo technical stuff. If I just claim that this is a ledger, that when an entry is written in to it, it's as if you had used a torch and written it in steel, okay? So it can't be modified or changed. Then you take that steel plate, because somebody could still you know, swap that steel plate out. And you put that steel plate in Mount Gox. I mean, Mount Cox. No, don't put it in Mount Gox. <laughs> Fort, Knox. Fort Knox. Fort Knox. Fort Knox. Go. You go put the, the steel plate in Fort Knox. And yeah. then say you decided that wasn't secure enough. Yeah. So you take Fort Knox-like security and you extend it to the entire state of Vermont so that every street and building in in, in Vermont is as secure as Mount, as Mount Gox, I'm saying that again, <laughs> as Fort Knox. And that's where you put Fort Knox. So, so you have to break into Fort Knox of Vermont State. Yeah. And then you have to break into Mount Gox to get to the steel plate to make a change. And then you say that's not good enough. You yeah. put Vermont in Texas. Right. Okay. And then you put Texas inside of the U.S. Every time you place it, down you're layering on it this impossible amount of security so layer upon layer, layer it, upon it layer. just becomes more and more secure over time yeah and eventually you have secured the entire solar system through all of these layers and literally the numbers work out such that i'm understating the amount of security here okay wow. because in reality the kinds of numerical um values of 256 bits is is just massively huge yeah um and but let's you say you've now secured the entire solar system uh, in this way so to in order to break in and change that 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 welded value on that steel plate you would have to break through the solar system and then you'd have to break through planetary defenses and then you'd have to break through continental defenses and then country defenses then state defenses you'd have to break all that yeah so that you could change a number that maybe secures, I don't know, 10 or $20? Right. Probably not worth your time. Okay? Even if it were trillions of dollars, it probably isn't worth your time because of the enormous cost. Okay? So, that, so that's how secure Bitcoin that's is. That's how secure Bitcoin cool. is. Now let's consider how much stuff I can put in that ledger. Mm -hmm. Imagine a shoebox. <laughs> that's how much data you can put in there. There's one meg. Every 10 minutes. That's about it. That's so, about it. So Factum solves this problem. Factum solves this problem by, because using math, okay, so, so because science, right? Using math, I can take the security that's in this one meg block and I can apply it to unlimited amounts of data. Okay. And it's done because the way this security works, um, I can take any digital artifact and I can create a fingerprint that is unique to that digital artifact. You know, there you can't create another digital artifact that has that fingerprint. And then I can put that fingerprint um, into Bitcoin. That's how some people were do this stuff. But I can also take that fingerprint and take somebody else's fingerprint, combine them and get a unique fingerprint for that pair. And then I can take that one and combine it with some other fingerprint. And that gives me a fingerprint that's unique to that pair. Now I've got essentially a chain of fingerprints. And you can think of it just like a logger's chain where each link is impossibly secure, as secure as that steel plate inside of Fort Knox. Now I can put multiple links at each level so that the chain spreads out and can 
It could literally secure petabytes of information even per minute with just a single hash into the Bitcoin blockchain every 10 minutes. Nice. So, so you're lever you're using the security of Bitcoin and you're leveraging that and basically having unlimited storage and unlimited right. really use cases. So, so the, the average person like me, I'm not super technical. I'm like, okay, sure. that's great. That sounds really impressive and technical. Tell me what the benefit of that is. What are some use cases? How can Factum change the world? Yes. Yeah, so, well, the, the, um, in order to understand this, because a lot of our critics don't seem to get it, okay? But in order to understand the value, you have to understand security. And you have to understand that security is like the um, Batman villain Two-Face, okay? Because there's two sides to this. One side is the actual informational content, you know, a secret, for instance, those private keys mm -hmm. want to keep them totally secret, right? That's one side of this problem. In fact, them does not directly address secrets. The other side of it is data integrity. Mm -hmm. And data integrity means that someone can't go into your bank account and change your balance. You know, it's not that, that the number, you know, like, Take my banking, bank account balance. Maybe it's $1,000.33. Okay. Yeah, I need to work more. <laughs> um, so I have $1,000.33. Uh, what did I say? 36, 33 cents. 33 Let's cents. So $1,000.33 yeah. in my bank account, right? Yeah. I would like to go into the bank and add a zero because $10,000.33. It's a little bit better. Yeah, it yeah. sounds like a little better. Or yeah. maybe two zeros, $100,000.33. What stops me? It's not the number. The number's not a secret. Mm -hmm. You and I just put it out on the podcast. It won't ha make a hill of beans difference to Wells Fargo whether we talked about $100,000.33 or $1,000.33 because the numbers aren't secret. What, mm -hmm. what data security in this case is, is can I go into their computer system and change that number right so factum solves that problem so factum is the security to be able to change what's already there right and to okay. know what was there and know when things changed and know what changes are valid and what changes are not valid okay awesome so assuming we understand security and we understand that mm -hmm. that's what factum is there for let's talk about some use cases okay what, sure. what, what can factum do well, one of the uh, use cases that has come up um, that uh, has been part of some of the criticisms of, of the project has been this land titling um, project yeah. the, in Honduras, okay? And um, the idea there was that we would use blockchain security to secure land titles. But what does that really mean? Does it mean that land is going to be traded on the blockchain and the the government can't take your land because something in the blockchain says they can't, eh, that ain't going to work. Because you know what happens? Land is something in the real world. Yeah. And in fact, somebody can come up with a gun and take your land. Yeah, you can't do anything. The blockchain doesn't stop that, right. that problem. So, so in order to understand why so many people were interested in Factum in Honduras, it, you you have to look at the process by which you add land to registries. And that is, you've got to take evidence that may be very, very fuzzy of own, about ownership. And you have to document that process and document who does the surveys and who does the, the um, um, background checks, does all title the checks title and, checks yeah. and all that. You have to take that process. That's what we end up securing in, in, in Factum. Um, different parties end up signing off on different elements and different steps in the process. And now the, the, the person who perhaps owns a plot of land in Honduras who goes through the system has the um, confidence that their claim was evaluated properly and recorded properly and then in the end, if someone wants to take the land, like the government, they can do that. But they have to go on record and say that yeah. on this date, we're taking the land. 
one of the things that happens over and over and over in many parts of the world is someone comes in, bulldozes some land. The people that were there say, well, we were living there. We've been living there for 300 years. Yep. And they go, prove it. Well, what did they have? It's gone. Yeah, there, there might be a piece of paper somewhere in an office or there might not, right? There might not be. Yeah. But even if, no matter what, I mean, what you you go out and you look at the land, you see nothing. Yeah. It's just, their, their, their it's history just yeah. is just gone. Yeah. So what Factum does is it'll, it, it takes away the power of groups to misrepresent the past. They can't, once you've gone through this process with Factum and you've, and you've documented the, the process and the ownership of a pro- piece of property, no force on earth can go back and say, oh, no, that, that never happened. Mm-hmm. Because all that security is, is securing the history. And this is something that I'm really excited about. I, I've been in the real estate space for a long time. And like I told you at the, uh, the Next Gen Angel event, that's something I'm excited about because that process, the escrow and the closing and the title transfer process is so... Uh, just it's it's we we need to go in the 21st century right yes yes and it's, it's so it's so 1940s right it, exactly and speaking of 1940s i actually bought an investment property on the east side of austin that was built in the 40s mm. and it took us four months to work out the ownership chain because the original owner passed away and tracking down who actually owned it the heirs and all that it took months and months and months and i'm like there's got to be a better way. So mm-hmm. is that something that Factum you think will eventually do in the States? I think eventually um, these kinds of systems will improve that process. Yeah. Uh, will it improve that process very fast? See, one of the things you have in the States is we have a, a nice, reasonable rule of law that forces you as the potential buyer to actually go through that process. Yep. And, 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 and so you didn't actually end up stealing somebody's property or, or cheating somebody out of uh, their share of the property because you, you went through the process. In, parts of the wor- in some parts of the world, that process, after a month, the buyer just says, ah, screw this, and just takes it. Yeah. You know, because there's not the same. Maybe they have to bribe somebody to look the other way. Maybe they they have to uh, get some paper inserted into the process that makes a ruling that the other guys don't know to show up and there's some legal mm. procedure. And don't. Um, and so, yeah, so this is, it, it, it is much, much, much more appealing to implement these systems in places where rule of law doesn't work real well. Um, yeah. than it is in places where, like the United States. It's it's called technology leapfrogging. Yeah. This is why in Africa, cell phones took over way before they took over here in the U.S. In fact, some of the people listening may still have a landline. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> we laugh. It's true. It's yeah. true, yeah. Now, I'm an old guy, <laughs> and I haven't had a landline in in 15 years Mm -hmm. uh i i went to voice over ip for my landline number um really early on because i just thought that was totally cool yeah and i remember that what was that company they would actually send you the little modem or well there was like vonage and 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 i and i went with another company that came before them and i can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head yeah but uh vonage used to do that and of course time warner put will bundle a phone with the with your cable and different companies still trying to get you to kind of have a landline sort of thing yeah yeah so so basically like these issues are going to be solved you think in like third world areas um it's kind of like bitcoin you know where Mm -hmm. more people are using bitcoin as a currency in africa and like you know places where there's currency controls and hyperinflation more so than in the states because a lot of people aren't afraid of you know a currency crisis right now right well, we're we're not afraid of a currency crisis in the U.S. We 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 are told constantly that inflation is very very low, uh, that yeah. zero even, and and part of that's because gas prices have gone down. Yeah. And that Yet the breaks. the price of housing, healthcare, and education is yeah. somehow. Yeah, yeah, don't get me on an economic <laughs> uh, bent. I'll 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 break your ear. We'll right. need po- we'll need part two. Yeah, we. Absolutely, because I, I, I'll get on my anti-inflation uh, rant, and yeah. I will, and I will prove to you 
that um, the uh, that all the world's evils can be attributed to inflation. Every single one of them, including that. Well, now now you have to expand like. on that. Let, let's oh, let's, no, no, let's no. do the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let's do the one minute version of why that's the case. Okay, I'll do the one minute version of okay. it. Inflation doesn't account for technology. Mm-hmm. So when, as we develop technology and and productivity and uh, um, processes, business processes that lower the number of resources uh, in terms of labor and raw materials that go into producing products and lower the cost of transporting them and putting them up for sale and selling them. We lower all those costs, okay? Mm -hmm. But inflation only cares about price change. And so what was the price in 1960 and what is the price today? And and while bread is generally not part of CPI, though it is in some flavors of CPI, uh, is something we all understand. Inflation basically makes the assumption that you, as a wage earner, should be paying the same amount for bread today, here in 2016 or whatever year it is, as we did in 1960. Even though it's become cheaper and easier to produce. Right. In 1960, 20% of the population was involved in farming. Mm -hmm. Today, less than 2%. Yep. Seriously, I should be paying the same amount for this mass-produced product as opposed to this very, very labor-intensive product in 1960? No, absolutely not. It Mm -hmm. should be practically free. Mm -hmm. There is a book called uh, um, Bamel's Cost Disease um, by William Bamel, and he he talks about uh, the fact that technology impacts different sectors differently Mm -hmm. and lowers those costs differently. Sure. And so that's the reason that medicine and education seem to be going up in cost so much is because they are more accurately looking and measuring the damage to the monetary supply by the banking and financing finance industries than uh, a basket of goods, large amounts of which are being imported from China and other, other places and sold in Walmart. Uh, you know, that basket of goods by which we judge inflation. So right. inflation is under measured. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. Yeah. Inflation is good for an economy when wages are too high. Mm-hmm. They are not. And uh, lastly, inflation in allowed the financial sector to grow from no more than 3% of the GDP for all of the 1800s to... Fully 8%, if I only consider the services that they had in the 1800s, yeah. fully 8% of GDP, if I include all the ones they invented since then, yeah. 30% of GDP. It's incredible. So so, what, what's, the, so what's, the, what's the fix to this? Do you think Bitcoin's going to shake things up or change that? I do believe that cryptocurrency and um, honesty... Uh, injected into the financial system, uh, honesty and settlement, honesty. Uh, well, for instance, uh, Patrick Burns' uh, whole thing of T zero, dealing with uh, honest settlement between uh, uh, parties with stock trades, mm-hmm. right? Yep. This kind of honesty will absolutely make a huge difference, and uh, I do think cryptocurrency is a solution. But cryptocurrency, in some sense, is less about um, Bitcoin and the blockchain, mm-hmm. and more about honest accounting of of who owes what to whom and when someone has to pay that back. So we talked a little bit about inflation. We talked a little bit about you know security and kind of the basics of Bitcoin and and where Factum's at. So what what are some use cases that you guys are working on right now? I know China came into the mix. Mm-hmm. What's going on over there? Well, we're, in China, they're, they're they're talking about smart cities. I can't. To give a whole lot of details, uh, some of which is because I don't know uh, all of the particulars yet. Um, part of it is that those are under non-disclosure, and I can't really talk about what I do know. Uh, I can talk in generalities, though. Well, what's a smart city? Let's start there. Okay, sure, certainly. Well, a smart city is about putting data collection to monitor things like utilities, traffic, uh Um, crime, uh, all kinds of factors, uh, things that go on inside of a city and 
building automated systems to deal with things where you can. Uh, things like routing traffic when there's an accident, uh, being able to, to uh, uh, essentially redirect traffic to keep traffic flowing mm -hmm. when there's a, a hiccup of some kind. Um, uh, monitoring pollution, which might be an input into, uh, um, let's say, uh, generate, uh, power generation plants uh, to back off uh, if, if the pollution's too high. Same thing with... Um, um, a bunch of other things. Uh, so it's bringing like the internet of things to cities. And oh, it, it's absolutely the internet yeah. of things. And, and, and here's where Factum plays a role in China. Mm -hmm. In China, they have a data integrity problem because if you go a month and then you are supposed to provide reports about what happened to uh, the city, you know, kind of um, the way we would do it today if, mm -hmm. if all things being equal. And I'm going to hand these reports and those are the basis by which the government or other corporations are going to pay me, then I really need to trust those reports. Yeah. Well, how do I trust the reports? Well, then I need to trust the data that was collected. How do I trust the data that's collected? Well, is it somebody writing it down? Yeah. Or is it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Where basically you guys are looking to set up networks or ledgers that sure. track that and take the human element out of it essentially. take human um and 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 other and other elements i mean because let's let's be honest some data will be lost mm -hmm. and so you will be in situations where you do not have all the data but the and that's also another thing that can happen in the real world is when data is missing and a party's responsible for providing the data they may just insert data that they've got just to fill it in because that's that's their service level agreement. That's that's how they're going to get paid. Yeah. So with Factum, you can provide these hashes that you've computed in real time, maybe at, even at the device level, and you've collected them together and hashed them all together and all that sort of stuff. So that uh, I have a what amounts to a very, very, very small amount of data that provides verification and validation to large bodies of data. Mm. And that's collected in real time. So when I go to audit that data, and you know I'm about to write a check to somebody, and I want to audit the data, I want to know a I have all the data, b nobody's monkeyed with it, yeah. and and that's what I can guarantee you. So we're not really in the uh, business of actually providing these solutions. We're mm -hmm. in the business of providing the data integrity that's underneath these solutions. Okay, cool. So I know one thing, well, I don't know personally, but I assume that working with governments is a very slow and pain in the ass process. Where are you, what can you speak about with Honduras? Is that still in the works? Is that falling through? I know there've been, you know, some critics of Factum that have said like, oh, well, it's never going to happen or, you know, what, where are you guys at with that? Well, we're continuing to, to talk. The negotiations uh, are continuing and um, we're, we're making um, some progress. Uh, it, it, when you said that um, uh, negotiating governments is a pain in the butt, I'm sorry, you understated it. It, yeah. It's it's way 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 worse because um, you're ruffling the feathers of the people that are profiting from the way things are, right? Well, <clears throat> actually, that's not that much of a barrier. Um, this is one of the criticisms too of Factum is that if this prevents people from lying, then obviously all the corrupt people in the world will oppose it. Okay, yeah. but this really really neglects a fundamental aspect of humanity, and that is humanity is made up of individuals. And individuals, pretty much, no matter who they are, want everyone else to be honest. Mm -hmm. So these questions always boil down to, do you have a majority that says, we, we want allowed dishonesty? Well, almost never. Because almost always, the majority of people in these dishonest situations would like the system to be honest mm -hmm. because they're not directly profiting from the dishonesty. There may be only a handful of people that are actually profiting. Yeah. In. And that handful will not want to stand up and say, you know, we're the dishonest we are the guys. Handful. We're yeah. the bad guys. <laughs> we would like to oppose this. Yeah. You know. So, so what is the move. challenge then? Is it just a slow process? It's a slow process. Move? Well, one, let's, let's be honest too about uh, blockchain technologies. There's not one enterprise level scalable blockchain solution out there mm -hmm. yet yeah we're, we're still in the infancy 
stage yeah. of this whole thing. And and we all claimed two two years ago that we would be coming out of the infancy infancy stage by this point. Yeah, mm, we're not. We're still there. Yeah. And so um, going back to the criticisms about the timing with Honduras, we announced the we announced the Honduras agreement. Um, uh, May of last year. Mm-hmm. Um, it turns out maybe about an hour and a half after we our our token sale, our original distribution was was done. Um, in an article that went out in India. Okay. Um, it, it was May. It, if we got an agreement inside of a year. That's actually pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I worked on the Texas Tears project. They were six years of of a cycle of request for uh, proposals, RFPs, uh, a year, and they went through two or three or four cycles before they selected a vendor, and then they only selected a vendor who, who I worked for AMS that did the specification. Okay. And then there was another vendor, a whole another RFP round. Yeah. Uh, who 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 came in after that? That was Deloitte. Yeah. So so it just takes time. Is what it you're takes a ton okay. of time. These okay. projects take time. Yeah. So right now, what's what's on your plate? China, Honduras, anything else big? Oh, um, uh, well, I mean, we we want to work in the mortgage um, sector. Mm-hmm. We we have um, uh, a very very good problem to to deal with there. And it's it's called the uh, system of record problem, mm-hmm. and that is that when you've got financial institutions that begin to fail, then a lot of times their systems of record go away. Mm-hmm. When systems of record go away, you can't necessarily validate the history of a mortgage. Yeah, there was that whole issue with Countrywide, right. and I actually was in that space right before the everything started to crumble. And I, there was actually a website called mortgage implode.com, I think. And it, it was just showing on a daily basis, these companies that were going under. And so the issue was that people were contesting the validity of their mortgages, right? Right. Well, yeah. they, they contested the validity of mortgages. They contested the history payment history because payment histories went away. Yeah. Um, and if, so if I talk about bank of America, who got a $17 billion fine for mismanaging mortgages in the, um, wake of all of that, mm-hmm. right. Their problem fundamentally was that they had, um, sets of records for mortgages that they didn't know if it was complete or not. Mm-hmm. Now the mistake they made was to decide to just make up crap. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, not probably not what you want to do. Yeah. And and so uh, or and and I say when they, you know, they filled in the holes or they assumed that the holes meant stuff didn't happen. Uh, bad sets of assumptions. Everything from honest mistakes to absolute corruption. And and what's really really sad is in this situation, the 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 auditable difference between honest mistake. And absolute corruption, very similar. Very similar. Yeah. Can't tell can't them di- apart. Can't differentiate. So you can't tell. So yeah. so I can say they were absolute criminals, and you could say, well, no, no, it was just mistakes were made, and yeah. and we can't tell the difference. But the fact remains, it needs to be improved. And, yes. And so how can Factum do that? So what Factum allows you to do is, as you process the mortgage through time, you factumize these artifacts. Now now you have a hash in, inside of a record. And it doesn't tell anyone, the outside observer, anything about the mortgage because it's really just a list of numbers, yeah. right? But now when um, Bank of America takes on a mortgage, they can take the documents they have, check them against this record, and say, we have 100% of the documents or we have 10% of the documents. And the customer over through time can also see this in real time that their stuff is being logged and, and it is correct. And so when a mistake is made, you can find it earlier, faster, and nearer to the problem. And thus, even if you end up missing a hash, you can at least at that time get a document placed in the chain that says, yes, we're missing this. We admit that. This is what should be there. And the closer you are to a mistake, that's the cleanest, easiest, and best place to rectify. Yeah, you can catch it quickly and fix it before it turns into right. a 
what was the sixty billion dollars? Seventeen billion. Seventeen billion. Jesus, Seventeen billion dollars. And 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 then what happens is too when you go to sell this mortgage, you got a value add because mm-hmm. the guy buying it a gets all the documents, b gets cryptographic proof he has all the documents. Yeah. Yeah. Then it makes it easier to sell to the secondary market and more liquid. Yes. Absolutely. More liquid is better. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> Sell them, move them. That's yeah. it. So how do you guys make money? How does Factum stay alive? Well, we're building uh, applications. We're building applications that sit on top of Factum and provide uh, facilities and, and, use ca- uh, and, and APIs and databases and whatnot that make this whole process run smoothly for our um, clients. So it's a, a function of... Uh, License fees for the technology, along with uh, some subscription models in some cases, like uh, land titling and whatnot, where uh, governments in particular are very prone to leap to subscription models because that means no budgetary item here until we have, as we are getting benefit, we're paying some some right start paying when it works right yeah start paying when it works yeah and and then and and then those fees are low now maybe over 20 years it's a bad deal but over two three four years that that are the political career uh of in uh period of of interest to those in the with political careers (laughs) (laughs) It's less risky up front, isn't it? It's less risky for the politicians. (laughs) They don't have to put up a billion dollars or whatever. It's politically less risky. Nice. Okay, so you guys are going to make money by providing these services to different uh, either countries or municipalities or private companies. Um, And then you guys have also raised capital through uh, issuing tokens. Factoids is what you call them, right? Well, we did the initial distribution with factoids, yeah. and um, it, it wasn't a particularly big one. The uh, the raise was about a half a million dollars. Uh, the the funds in that are locked against milestones, of which we've only um, delivered on one of them. We we've, we've delivered the running protocol for everyone to use, and it's been running uh, since September. Yeah. Uh, the second milestone is actually to deliver on the distributed protocol. And uh, that's what um, I've been working on. Uh, I have, we, we, we are looking at uh, pushing that out um, very soon. And when that goes out, then we'll, be get, we'll push the protocol to be running on um, at least eight servers, uh, only one of which we'll, we will control. The other seven will be controlled outside of, of through the network. Yeah, well, yeah. well, different different groups will step up. The, we're a federated server system, mm-hmm. which means that the um, servers are known um, in short periods of time are known prior to recording uh, the data. They're not over a long period of time. You have no idea who the servers are going to be, but in the short term, you do. Okay. Then the users of the protocol vote on which servers will run the protocol. That's the third milestone is elections. And when we get each one of these milestones, these three milestones, we get a third of the money from the token sale. It's being held by um, by third parties who uh, hold the funds and evaluate our m- milestones, our nice. candidates. Nice. I, and, and I know that's a, a really kind of touchy part of cryptocurrencies is Mm -hmm. you know people raising money through token sales because there have been so many as the community calls it shit coins you know Mm -hmm. basically pump and dumps and Mm -hmm. and scams and that's why i was really happy to have you here is because i believe in this type of thing where people are actually innovating and actually doing things not just coming up with a copycat bitcoin that really doesn't have any value but are are actually looking to to improve the world in some way right and 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 it's important to understand why the token exists the token exists to provide uh an incentive to the federated service because there will be seventy three thousand of these tokens that are generated every month and distributed amongst the federated servers Mm -hmm. okay now so that means that our 8.7 million um, factoid supply that exists today will, once elections start, and then then these payments begin, will begin to inflate. 
But countering the inflation or, or balancing the inflation is the actual use of the protocol. And that's because when someone wants to use the protocol, they need entry credits. And you get entry credits by converting factoids into entry credits and assigning them to a public-private key pair, an entry credit address. That entry credit address and the entry credits in it are non-transferable. They're, they're, they're essentially out of the ecosystem. So once you basically purchase or acquire these and you use them, it's not like Bitcoin that you can kind of send around. Right. Once you've, once you've created entry credits and you've written data into Factum, the, the factoids behind that are gone. And the exchange rate between the factoids is managed um, by the, the, the parties involved in the, in the protocol, yeah. and it's kept at a tenth of a cent. And so because the exchange rate is at a tenth of a cent today, tomorrow, and the next day, that means that if Bitcoin, I mean Bitcoin, if factoids price goes through the roof, then all of a sudden one factoid gets you tons and tons of entry credits, mm -hmm. which means that if you don't have a balancing amount of business on the protocol, the, um, a number of factoids in the supply will grow. So it's kind of self equal right. and that'll bring yeah, yeah. <laughs> that'll bring the price down. Okay. But the opposite's also true if if people start dumping their factoids because they don't want them and the value of the factoid goes way below um, the use of the protocol. Uh, it takes a lot more factoids to buy an entry credit. So an entry credit requires more factoids. That means that every time somebody writes into the protocol and buys an entry credit they're pulling factoids out of the supply. So the supply will fall until you again balance the use of the protocol against the value. And so, so basically it's constructed to be stabilizing. And all of this accounting is done outside of Bitcoin. So none of this is consuming Bitcoin uh, blockchain space. Okay. And all of it's unavoidable. You, you, no matter what you do, um, you need to pay your servers something. And you can either figure out a way to pay them Bitcoin, in which case, as this becomes more and more popular, there's more and more Bitcoin um, transactions, or you figure out some way to get the accounting done somewhere else. And mm -hmm. so we're, we're trying to keep it done somewhere else. And if I'm a user and I wanna use the protocol and I don't wanna touch anybody's coin, bingo. You can go to our website, and buy entry credits with a credit card, your, um, your entry credit address will now be charged with entry credits. You can now create chains and create entries, and you're golden. It's not a tradable token, so it's not an altcoin. It's a, effectively a virtual account, but it's anonymous. It's, it, there's no requirement for you to report yourself. You, you don't run any regulatory risk of handling an altcoin if you're let's say you're a bank and you're you need to buy you know 10 million dollars worth of uh entry credits mm -hmm. to write into the blockchain if i had to buy 10 million dollars worth of a token uh, whether it's crypto i mean whether it's uh counterparty or omni or ripple or or ether or anything else if i have to buy that much I'm going to have to account for that. Yeah. I'm going to have to report it on my taxes. There are all kinds of other things, costs that yeah. go along with it. With entry credits, it's simply a purchase of... of it's a product other than... It's a product. The, it's yeah. a license. It's yeah. it, You won't have to do any of that stuff. Who, who should be interested in buying these tokens or who should be interested in using Factum or learning about Factum? Well, I think the, the interesting thing is using uh, Factum. So people that have uh, recording um, uh, interests, um, for instance, uh, copyright, proving that you went through the creative process to generate this particular work of art, um, that's important. It's very, very inexpensive in Factum at a tenth of a cent per entry to um, put data into Factum to prove your creative process. Um, uh, eventually, um, technologies like uh, uh, that, that, that can be used to track 
um, IP. Uh, that's real, very interesting. Uh, document hist histories. Um, so contracts and contracts. Agreements. This stuff is all very good because if you've got essentially a factomized record of a document, then it's not going to get changed on you later on. Mm -hmm. And um, the example I like to give is the one where um, the, the most obvious one where you just can't fix it if it goes wrong. And that's your will. Uh, you go and you create a number of versions of your will over time, and then you die. You're not around to point out, that's that the latest the one. That was the one I really wanted. That's the one I yeah. wanted. No? You, know, you just can't. You're not there. So you can't fix it. So, And and a lot of times the, it involves trust. You, you're, you're providing all these copies to some party, whether it's a lawyer or anybody else, and somebody has to produce the latest and greatest and and not forget that last edition where you wrote the lawyer out of your will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so basically, just to kind of wrap this up, what Factum can do, and mm -hmm. anything having to do with you want to track something over time, you want to track contracts, you want to track wills, ownership, property records, anything along shipping those lines. Containers. Shipping containers. Shipping uh, containers. Um, um, origin of product. Uh, there, that's a big one. Do you have a, uh, a transaction log behind this food that you're eating to assure you that, in fact, it really was produced in the U.S. and not produced, you know, somewhere you else in the world? That's a big deal. I know there's a lot of stuff coming out of Thailand with slave labor and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. this could really shake things up. Yeah. So nice. Um, Paul, I've got a rapid fire five questions sure. for you. What does true wealth mean to you? What does true wealth mean to true you? True wealth. What does that mean to you? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind uh, for me is a, is, is a meaningful uh, life. Uh, you know, you, you certainly want your needs met and, um, to be able to meet the needs of those around you. But uh, I think a meaningful life is true wealth. Nice. Uh, I don't, you know, money, uh, I, I've had money uh, and I've not had money at different points in my life. And I don't know that money really qualifies as true wealth at all. What does meaningful life mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> meaningful <laughs> life. Well, I, I, I would like to think that when um, I... Uh, leave this earth that that I've left it a better place than uh, I than than I found it when I got here. I I would like to think that I helped the people around me and I help I've uh, created systems that make people's lives better, easier. Um, that it's been a force for equality, but not not in a bad way. Like, uh, I'm going to go out and take everybody's stuff and give it to other people kind of way. But rather, you, we, 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 life shouldn't be a casino. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, it's always a game. Mm -hmm. uh, like I like to tell people, life is just a game, so don't take it seriously. Just play to win. There you go. And uh, so I think uh, a, a meaningful life is 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 a life you didn't take too seriously, but you played it as hard as you could. Nice. I like it. Where, where do you want to see Factum in the next several years? I don't want to put a time frame on it, but in the future, what do you want Factum to look like? I, I want Factum to be an accepted place to put uh, meta protocols and data and, 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 and infusing, infusing the secure, the, the data integrity and security of Bitcoin into all sorts of business processes, um, uh, making this world more honest because I do think honesty matters. is, well, it matters, but it's subversive. Mm. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult to take a stand against honesty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Are there any books, um, that you think are required reading for somebody wanting to get into cryptocurrencies? Oh, well, the white paper. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, Satoshi's I'll, white paper. Satoshi's we'll white, link that up. It's, Satoshi's white paper is is very, very readable, surprisingly short. And, and had I read it when I first heard of Bitcoin, I would be worth millions more than I am today. Mm. So um, I don't think the revolution's over, so I still think it's worth reading. Um, 
Uh, boy, uh, I am not entirely sure what other books. The Martian. Okay. I think that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> nice, nice. We'll link that up. <laughs> you know the and, yeah. And, well, I'll tell you what. Not cryptocurrency, just books that I like. Yeah, uh, I definitely Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay. Um, it is. It, it, you know, I wish I could be a pale shadow of uh, of uh, S- Scott Adam, no, uh, Adams, Adams, Douglas Adams, um, but I, but I'm not anyway. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, One Punch Man. If you haven't uh, read the web web comic and watched the anime. Absolutely. Okay, awesome. I'm, I'm a huge one. I, man what, what I do is after every interview, I actually order all the books. So oh, I'm, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have <laughs> that. And then we do book reviews several weeks later. So. Oh, <laughs> yeah, this is scary. I love it. No, no, not at all. It's uh, fun reading is, is good. I think it's important. What, do you have any uh, strong predictions or ideas of where Bitcoin's going to be? Price wise, uh, I don't really care about price. I, I'm I'm talking more like user adoption. I think price will follow. Everybody worries so much about price, and I'm a trader, so I worry a lot about. I don't worry, but I think a lot about the price. Let's forget price, and let's say, where do you think Bitcoin's going to be in the world? Where I think Bitcoin uh, has right now a big challenge of dealing with uh, governance, and and I think all the parties involved in the block size debate a lot of your listeners won't know that that's going on but basically bitcoin is reaching a transactional limit Mm -hmm. and so there are different strategies to raise that limit i think all the parties involved will solve that problem whether we solve it without hitting the car in front of us i don't really know because i at, at times i told some guy on the internet the other day i feel like i'm I'm riding in a car with a teenager who's tailgating at 70 miles an hour in the fog. You know? Yeah. It's a little scary because I, I would like to have a little more space in the for transactions so that we have the space for adoption and to build these solutions that allow Bitcoin to scale. Do you have an opinion on what the block size should be? N- not really. I I, I think the hard limit is archaic, and I wish it would go away in in favor of a soft limit. I, I'm, but but that's my own opinion. Um, I, I I've done the math. I don't think um, a, a, a modest raise to two or three megs is going gonna to bother anybody. Mm-hmm. And I don't. And, and that would give us a couple more years to build a bunch of other technology. There are some technologies coming on board that will uh, essentially create transactional layers where not everything's on the blockchain. And and I do believe that in two or three years, we'll see uh, Bitcoin uh, continue to increase adoption. And I do think if we have a huge financial crisis, then uh, Bitcoin may uh, get yet another big boost. Yeah. And uh, even though you don't say, I, you say I shouldn't, say anything about price i think if we have a a a reasonable solution to the block size issue by the summer then i think we'll end the year um uh, you know with new highs uh for bitcoin value yeah so over 500 what's your prediction yeah let's do a prediction let's forget what i said five minutes ago over over 1200 over 1200 i i I, I believe we'll have new highs okay new highs nice new highs oh we're talking new new highs new highs not local highs yearly highs no 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 not not so you're bullish okay oh i'm totally bullish i yeah of course if you'd ask you've kind of got to be if you're in the space Yes, if you'd asked me in 2015, I would have told you five grand at the end of 2015. So <laughs> my my observations are worthless, yeah. truly, truly worthless. But yeah. that's where I'll I, I that's my story. I'm sticking to it, and nice. I don't care how what evidence you put. In front of me. Uh, <laughs> that's the thing, right? There's so yes. many variables. I'm like, I can predict out maybe two weeks, maybe, maybe, maybe. you know, maybe. And but, that's that's just assuming no news hits. It, news hits, and 
<laughs> yeah, it shakes it up. That's why I'm a trader, short term. Yeah. Look to make money on the upside and downside. Um, Ethereum is going to continue to make advances. I, I think they're um, right now a new. Um, uh, they're the new thing. Yeah. They're 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 the 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 cat's meow. They don't have any um, hard limits that mm -hmm. Bitcoin's running into. Um, I I think they've got the benefit of a lot of very very smart people writing very reasonable code, mm -hmm. and so I think that they they will scale easily within you know for anything that you throw at them for a year or two. Do you think Ethereum could overtake Bitcoin as kind of the crypto? Well, that's the danger. That's yeah. the danger. If Bitcoin doesn't deal with the block size issue, then uh, then then some coin like Ethereum or some coin like Dash or or any other of these altcoins that um, are that that are substantive, yeah. uh, Litecoin. Yeah. I, I'll go out there and I'll go out on a limb and say Litecoin. Is has started the 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 long the death spiral the long, long walk. kiss good night yeah, yeah long kiss good night it it's it's it doesn't present anything interesting enough to be the replacement for Bitcoin mm. so now Charlie Lee might shoot me for saying that but <laughs> well that's all right there you have <laughs> twelve hundred Bitcoin by the end of the or over twelve hundred over Bitcoin 1, by the end of the year yes yes um, Ethereum's moving up Factum and you guys are doing some cool stuff and, we're doing some good stuff yeah. I think um, you know I, I I refuse to talk about the currency but I do think that the protocol is going to uh, people are it's going to surprise people it, it doesn't matter we've been talking about Factum for over a year and a half mm -hmm. going in front of everybody we possibly could to tell them what a great idea it is we're we're delivering yeah. and that delivery is is going to shock people that they, they, there's just too many people who have become jaded about blockchain projects that haven't delivered and this architecture will deliver. And so, well, that there you have it, guys. I mean, I, I think that's, again, the biggest reason why I'm impressed with you guys is because you are focused on execution. You have a great team and um, best of luck to you guys. And hopefully we can do a follow up maybe a year from now when everything's kicking. Oh, yeah, yeah. One way or the other. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thank you. <laughs>